noise is less annoying with a healthy dose of poison. As long as I can shoot and suck and plow and blast away, I promise you that I'll improve this harsh terrain with every passing day. From Canada's perspective, the Indian was a problem needing a solution. In 1879, a report by Nicholas Flood Davin recommended the Canadian government operate industrial schools, partnering with churches to teach them skills and replace their spiritual beliefs with Christianity. John A. Macdonald agreed, saying, when the school is on the reserve, the child lives with his parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. This lofty approach to education was not new. Industrial and reformatory school programs were set up in Ireland to reform orphans and problem children. Honest labor and ruthlessly cutting ties from home life would help reform the child's character. It was declared a success until decades later, a commission report revealed that many children had been subject to systematic physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. Here on Turtle Island, the experiment with children was to be applied to a foreign culture en masse. They were to be separated forcefully from their parents, their language, and their culture. There's something different about seeing the evidence for yourself. At the Glenbow Museum, these artifacts, like the writing on stone or chip rocks, crystallize the stories in my mind. Each student photo, each story of trauma, cries out from the past to make itself known in the present. Number 12 was forcibly taken away by her parents to attend a tobacco and was absent about two days and returned on intervention of agent. By way of punishment, she is not allowed to go out for a month's holiday. All the children except four show the presence of tuberculosis in a state that requires active treatment, as the children are now fighting a losing battle with this dread disease. 16 of the 33 have been affected the Indian residential schools were only the tip of the iceberg. One year before Treaty 7 was even signed, the Indian Act had already been put in place, a document that controlled and regulated every aspect of Indian life, treating all Indians as wards of the state. Traditional ceremonies like the potlatch and sundance were banned, punishable by fines or jail sentences. Rations were withheld until the Indians complied with government edicts. Indian agents, who were given extraordinary power over reserves, created their own pass system. Indians could not leave the reserve, sell, or buy without their permission. Here, a receipt has been repurposed as a permission sheet. It was like watching a genocide in slow motion. The goal was to kill the Indian and the man, but instead, both were killed. Was this the best that civilization could do? The treaty we broke was not so much the written one filled with augers and shovels and five dollars. It was the unwritten one that was made based on a trust and a commitment to help. Whether through incompetency, indifference or disdain, it was a treaty broken over and over, generation after generation. The trauma of the past continues to ripple outward, crashing through the present. We're at uh, what is now Red Crow College. Prior to that, it was St. Mary's Residential School. And this is the school I attended. Uh, my mom attended this school, uh, my uncles, you know. So I'm about third generation of uh, people that, that came here. It's a facade that's misgiving. You know. It was built in 1924. And the reason that Red Crow is in here is that we don't have any money to build a college, right? And structurally, these were very well built. 
my playmates would be gone eh, in September and I'd miss them. And I'd ask my mom, where are they? And they'd say, well, they went to school. I say, well, I want to go where they're going. Little did I know what was in this building. It's almost like going to jail, I guess. You're processed and then, then you're brought up to, your, to, to the rec hall. And I was assigned the number 27. 27 was, it's funny how you remember these. Eh? All the clothes that are issued to you, you put that number on. So you get punished if you can't find your shoes or your, because the, the supervisor will say, this is 27. You did what you needed to do to survive this. I became Christian. That was my survival. And now I'm not, you know, after realizing that. I have nothing but sad memories of that church. But our people are really involved in it, and, and they get mad when they hear things like that. And, and they'll take me up on it, and that's fine. But this represents a lot of damage that's been done to our community. This is very new, taking the children away from the home and bringing them. It doesn't even work for the people that brought it to us, right? So it works even less with us. And it creates a sense of confusion of who we are as Native, or in this case, Ghana. And I know that from my own personal journey. I've been sober for going on 27 years. It was so refreshing to see this awful place from a different perspective. <laughs> you know, you worked on those little, little victories. That's what sustained us. It's kind of interesting, somebody was telling me that in these concentration camps, the Jews would wear their lapel in a certain way to defy what's going on, that they're not going to give in, they're not going, their spirit is not going to die. Well, the biggest defiance is who I am now, who I have become, which is complete anti, anti to this place. I was worried I was gonna come back and find you guys gutted. So when I look at this building, it's almost like this is a rejected transplant. That's how I see it. This is a rejected way of life because there's no honor to it. There's no respect for it. Like it's been completely dilapidated. And, and I see that with a lot of things. Like, you know, people talk about, well, you have houses that are run down on the reserve. Well, that's not the inherent lineage of culture and relationship to home and land, kitoks and what sustains us, like thousands of years of connection to home and the way you live is completely severed. The way people are going to adapt to that epigenetically is, you know, nine times out of 10 is gonna be a rejection of whatever the transplant is especially if the transplant surgery is a violent one, a destructive one. And when we first walked in here, two owls come bursting out. And in Blackfoot culture, the owl is a messenger. And they've been connotated in the last hundred years negatively as messengers of death. And I don't know what that means. The way I feel, feel it right now is, uh, I'm taking it as a positive connotation that the only death that's occurring in this journey that we have here in this film is the death of the conditioning, is the death of those imposing constructs we get ourselves trapped in. And that's, that's what sort of enables humanity to do inhumane things. I'm very critical of Western education because to me, they're very complicit into what we're dealing with today in terms of the environment. That's where a lot of the engineers, that's where a lot of the geologists go. That's where a lot of the CEOs go and they end up in these board offices. And to me, these universities teach you not to be human. You know, they take, you know, they take away your feelings, your humanity. 
that you can make strict business decisions and that it is okay. It isn't. Now, that kind of thinking has been established. Today, it's called capitalism, and it becomes very senseless. I say we got treated like women as natives. The Lanayan got treated like women because they use words, we can rape the land, you know. It's very derogatory, but that's what you hear. Narses saw a different future for Red Crow College, a path towards healing for his people. Years ago, he started a college-level program called Gainai Studies that would teach the history and culture of the Nitsitipi. I hated this ceiling because I'd be looking at it. And those are the original, the original cupboards. Eh? And sister was in that room. We had a good sister. Her name was Sister Delia Bork. She was a uh, Métis. She tried to mother us. They would send word to punish us. And she would lie and say, no, I didn't. Or she would say, I punished them when she didn't. Just because they were nuns like that or I had good teachers doesn't justify what they did here because we're still dealing with it today. And through Kainai studies, we're trying to turn it around. Eh? There's a lot of beauty in who we are as Nitsitapi. And we snub our nose and say, you did not succeed in destroying us. I want to become Nitsitapi, a person, a human. So for me, becoming that through experience and all the mistakes I've made and all the wonderful things I've done all come together to make me who I am. A person that wants to learn. A person that respects myself so that I can respect you guys. That's why our ways are lifelong learning. If I can become a human, then I can relate to the land better. When we say land, uh, people think right away in this language of geography and stratigraphy. Well, for me, when I say land, in the back of my mind, I'm saying what sustains us. It's very inclusive of the four-legged of the animals that take flight, uh, the rivers, uh, the plants. We had relationship to all of them. There's enough for all of us. Take what you need. Don't take more than you need. So that teaches us, that is very relevant to today because the first thing I get told is that we can't go back to that time. Well, of course we're not going. We can't. Who said we could? But what did that time, what can it teach us? Well, they say we can't put the buffalo back because it's unrealistic. Well, the road we are on, if we're going to talk unrealistic, is unrealistic and unsustainable.